Alrighty, welcome everyone to Value Investing Live. Hopefully you enjoyed that brief little moment with our new intro graphic there. We've been working hard on upping our stream quality here. I am pleased to welcome our guest this week, Richard Simmons, who is joining us for a return visit. And he is actually lucky enough to be joining us today from Italy. For those of you out there in the audience, as always, please feel free to post those questions and comments, everything like that, in that chat section throughout the presentation. We are going to be keeping things relatively casual today, so if there are pertinent questions that do come up, I'll be more than happy to pass those on to Richard as we go. Other than that, though, uh, please do feel free to like the video. If you do like it today, we do really appreciate it. Make sure you subscribe for any future content, and go ahead and comment your favorite part once we finish up. Other than that, we are going to go ahead and hand things over to Richard. We'll jump in. Why don't you give us, uh, for those that are new joiners or, or don't remember our, our previous conversation back in January, give us a, a little bit of a rundown on Derby Street, who you guys are, what you do, a little bit of the background there. Well, it's difficult to believe that anyone can forget uh, the presentation of six months, but I will just um, throw up um, a slide um, that um, is a slightly updated version of um, what we looked at together last time, just to give a brief uh, background to, um, to Derby Street. Um, Derby Street's um, two funds that are based in the Cayman Islands launched uh, just over eight years ago in 2013. And there's one fund that invests in UK equities and one in European equities. Um, and uh, I've been managing money since 2001 as a professional. So there is a 20-year um, tra track record altogether all and uh, eight years in these funds, which are only investing in equities, very occasionally in, in bonds, when the bonds have equity-like returns, but mainly in, in equities, and a long only. Um, and that means we don't leverage, we don't uh, short, uh, we don't use derivatives. Um, fairly concentrated, you see, see there. Uh, we're probably more concentrated than usual right now because we found some really good things. Um, but the, the largest positions are around the 10 to 12 percent number and there's an, uh, an exception which we'll talk about later and the returns have been pretty good they're summarized there but just to give you a nice uh, graph so that uh, for those who are more visual um which doesn't include me i love the numbers but you know some people <laughs> some people like graphs uh I think what's interesting in these graphs, this is the UK one to know, is that the, the UK stock market and, and as you'll see the European uh, index as well has not really done very much in these last eight years. That grey dismal line at the bottom there um, is showing just 6% cumulative for the UK stock market uh, since the fund started. And we're up 71%. And in the European markets, although the market's done better, 48% cumulatively, uh, we're up 196 percent that's to the end of March um, so um, uh, that's uh, that's a very brief uh, idea about uh, about what we're doing definitely so let's go ahead move on obviously it's been six months uh, since we last talked it's it's been quite a while uh, things have changed uh, for a lot of people out there. We are still uh, in an ongoing pandemic. On the investment side of things, how have things been going? Uh, have investments been panning out? Obviously, there's been some good performance there. Um, has anything in particular kind of stood out for you there? I suppose, uh, yeah, I'll talk about the results for this year in just a second, but just to, just to wind it back slightly, and uh, you will remember some of this, Graham, but we went into the pandemic with a lot of cash. I think it was a, around about 30% in both funds for no conscious reason. I think it was just uh, we'd sold things and hadn't find things. We, uh, we spent almost everything uh, quite feverishly in those few months of that, that first um, lockdown. And... Um, that turned out to be 
a good thing to do anyway, um, but we're not really market timers. Uh, and, you know, we've had, it was a very interesting experience. I can talk a bit later about things that we sold afterwards, um, but certainly the things that we bought um, and held did very well. Um, th this year to June, uh, uh, the UK fund is up over 20%, uh, which is 11% ahead of the market. And the European fund is up nearly 16%, which is a few percent ahead of the market. And of course, as you probably, or as you may remember, that's after a great 2020, uh, when the European fund beat the market by 4% and the UK fund beat the market by 18%. So we're now routinely in the top uh, 1% or sometimes at the very top of our um of our morning star categories. So doesn't sound like too much to complain about there. You can always do better. <laughs> can always get there. <laughs> All right. So continuing on, um, in our last chat, we hit on a couple different stock examples of exciting companies that you had either just found or had been looking at for a while there, uh, namely Naked Wines and Moore's Club. Now, it's been six months. Have those panned out? Especially, I believe it was uh, the Naked Wines one was one of the more fresh ones there. Uh, how have those gone for you over the last six months here now? Yeah, you're absolutely right. They were, they, those are the two names that we were very excited about uh, six months ago. Naked, Naked Wines, you'll, you'll remember, it's, it's one of the leading online wine sellers in the UK and Australia. But its biggest market is the States, and the States has continued to grow. They've all grown. Uh, but the States is now very big for them. And that that uh, business has accelerated because of the lockdowns. It was already growing fast. So it grew very fast last year. It won't grow as fast this year uh, because uh, people will be able to buy wines in restaurants and probably go back to the shops a little bit. Um, but its long-term prospects, uh, we believe, are intact because... Um, because it's an obvious thing to say now, but it's become more obvious in the last year. Online is displacing so many um, retail businesses uh, because it's it's convenient and um, it's also sticky. So you will remember that Naked Wines has got a category of members called Angels who deposit regular amounts um, in their accounts to prepay for special wines and qualify for discounts. So... Um, Naked, therefore, has negative working capital. It has cash generated from its customers, which is an unusual and big asset. So there's a growing cash balance, and it, it can use that cash to reinvest its marketing promotions. In terms of how well it's done, uh, we, uh, we bought it, uh, I think, uh, last summer for the first time, or thereabouts. Uh, we're up about 70% on our average cost. But more importantly, we think it's got a massive future ahead of it. Um, the I hate this expression because it's so overused now, but the total addressable market is um, maybe 10 or 20 times bigger than what it is now. And Naked is one of the leaders. Uh, so that's um, it's not particularly highly valued. So that's, that's still a very exciting and large position, probably around 10%. Morse is also around 10% of the, of the UK fund, and it was brand new um, when you and I last met, um, and we bought a lot more since. So that was the early days of our uh, investment. We're up about 30% on average in, in that uh, six months. So our average holding time, obviously, less than six months. It's had uh, two very positive um, updates this year. The, the, regular set of results and, and um, a trading update, we call it here. And you'll remember that it's, um, it's an unsecured consumer lender. So its main business, which used to be literally going door to door to people's houses, collecting lending money, uh, was upset in many ways by, by COVID. Uh, there was a reduction in demand, there were collection problems, and so there were increased provisions in the loan book. And they also had a division, a digital division, which was loss making. But that was really where the opportunity came. Um, uh, we thought we thought that demand would come back, that provisions would go back to normal levels, and the digital division um, would become profitable. The real results are a little bit more complex than that. 
Uh, they've grown the digital business very rapidly and they've taken customers out of the old doorstep lending and steered them towards the digital business, which is just, again, as with Naked, it's just a cheaper, more reliable, easier way of managing customers. Um, and they can make faster and cheaper decisions that way too. Uh, and on top of that, uh, one of their largest competitors has left the market under pressure. And there was also some civil litigation risk and that seems to have subsided. So all in all, it's a good position um, just in six months in. Um, the combined business is not yet back to its pre-pandemic level, but it's well on its way. And we think we've paid at most six times uh, what earnings will be. And when I talk about earnings, I mean real, you know, post-tax profits, maybe a lot less than that. Uh, it is a lending business, so it has risks, but one factor that isn't present in this business that is in all of its peers is debt. It has next to no debt, net debt. So really the risk in this one, uh, would, you know, ought to be uh, quite uh, small. You'll, you'll see from these examples that, I, you know, we prefer businesses with little downside risk, but a lot of upside. Definitely. So some decent success there. Sounds like things are going pretty good with those holdings. Obviously, only the future is going to tell how things are truly going to pan out, but fingers crossed that they are going to go well there, and it does sound like they are going relatively well. Continuing on, obviously, you've had some time over the last couple of months to jump into new things or sell out of holdings one way or another. Have you found any new and exciting positions that you'd like to share with us today? Uh, well, we we have a, a new, very large position in the UK fund, which is a 15 percenter. Uh, that is uh, unusual. Um, and perhaps I can explain why. I'll just talk, talk for a few minutes about it, if I may. Um, it illustrates a third strand, a third strategy. If Naked Wines is, a, is, a, is an exemplar of a, a very good growth business, if you like, and Morse's is an example of what I sometimes call a hidden story or an asset because of the losses in some of the businesses, which are masking a, an underlying profitable business. This is from our third uh, strategy, which we call uh, liquid, uh, liquidations or realizations. So these are these are companies which are quoted, uh, but they're winding up. They're, they've got a shareholder mandate to sell their assets and to um, return the, the capital to the shareholders, which happens here in a fairly tax efficient way. So we get a we get a clean look at uh, the asset value once it's all returned to us in cash. This isn't actually a brand new position because we we first invested in it in 2018. Um, but we've made some large purchases since then, including some very big purchases in the pandemic. And uh, as I said, it's, it's a 15% position now. It's called Electra, Electra Private Equity. Uh, it's a fully listed in the UK as different markets, but this is a fully listed UK investment trust. And it's quite a well-known investor itself in buyouts. So it's a private equity firm or what we call buyout. So these are not startups. These are mature businesses that are bought um, out from their existing owners, sometimes with debt. And it started its liquidation, its realization process in 2016. Um, but uh, it's, it's reached really a very, very late stage. Um, and this goes somewhere to explain why, why we've allowed it to become so big. Um, the, the other nice thing about it is that uh, there's a very good business partner here called Sherborne. So they're managing the liquidation. And one, of, one of the risks in these things, we've invested about 17 of these types of uh, situations so far in the fund. One of the risks is that the process is halted by a new shareholder who comes in to take control. You don't usually lose money there, but it stops the liquidation and it means uh, that uh, the upside is capped at that point. Um, but this is very unlikely that Sherborne is committed to, to seeing this, this through. Um, they've done a very good job as well so far, so that's a good sign. We've, we've received a large part of our initial investment back already through special dividends. And net, we're up around 43% uh, to date. But because of the dividends and the short average holding time, I think our IRR is a lot, happy, uh, a lot uh, higher than that. 
So Electra, just to get into a slight bit of detail with it, um, has two businesses, two investments left, which are essentially wholly, wholly owned subsidiaries of Electra. Um, neither of them is perfect businesses. Uh, perfect businesses. There's a small. There's a small one, which is a shoe retailer with a, a large amount of online and some shops. I won't say much about it because it's it's under a tenth of the net asset value. Uh, net cash and other bits and pieces are about fifteen percent of net asset value. So the bulk of it, what's left, which is nearly eighty percent, is a wholly owned restaurant chain. Uh, which you probably have heard of because it's uh, TGI Fridays, um, right? But this isn't your TGI Fridays. This is the UK business, uh, which separated from the American business, the, the American former American parent, uh, some years ago. So there's no real relationship, but it's an American-themed restaurant chain. And again, as with Morse's, some of the other American-themed restaurant chains have actually gone out of business or massively shrunk in the UK through the pandemic. And that's not been the case with Electra, which has benefited from having a relatively strong balance sheet compared to other restaurants, having this very supportive parent. Um, right at the beginning of the pandemic, we did sell some of our shares in Electra, but we had a chance to buy them back only about two months later, as the lot um, in at a very um, good price. In fact, the price we paid then didn't or hardly valued the restaurant chain at all. So we paid pennies on the pound, you might say, for, uh, for Fridays uh, at that point. Um, as I said a few minutes ago, we're, we're in the final phase, really, of this liquidation. Um, Ele uh, Electra has decided to spin out Fridays as a separate quoted company. So we'll get a spin-off or a spin-co, if you like, um, in a few months' time. The shoe business will remain as the sole operating business. Folks, we may have lost Richard here. We'll give a we'll give it a second or two. I am gonna go ahead and toss up our logo here while we try and get reconnected with him. Uh, just bear with us for just a second.
Uh, have you got a rough idea where I was? Uh, uh, we, we, were, uh, we were talking about Electra. Um, I believe we just hit on uh, TGI Fridays uh, spinning off onto its own thing and the yeah, yeah. Uh, shoe sales business remaining as uh, the only kind of thing left there. Very good. That was just a test for you to make sure you were paying attention. That was a very good summary. Yeah, so um, just to hurry along and uh, uh, not to bore anyone, we, we are coming to the end. Within a few months, we'll have these two tradable assets and some residual cash. For reasons similar to Morse's, Fridays has actually come out of the pandemic far stronger than it went in. The fewer competitors, higher margins, higher like for likes sales. I won't go through the maths, uh, but it's difficult uh, for us to see that the combined obvious value of these three parts, the shoes, the restaurants, and the cash, to be less than £8 a share, and it could be as much as 11 So we've got to, uh, you know, our estimate, a notional range of £8 to so £11 a share, and the current price is just under six. So um, why is it such a large position? We think there's an upside of 35 to, to 80 percent, and that should realize within a few months. And the downside ought to be, you know, fingers crossed, it ought to be fairly limited. Uh, if there were another big lockdown, that would be the biggest risk, I suppose. But Fridays has, has survived one of those already. Understood. Well, it does sound like uh, some exciting opportunities there looking out into the future. So once again, fingers crossed, hopefully it'll all go well there. Looking on now, uh, that today, uh, for those of you out in the audience, is going to round out the majority of our, our pre-prepared comments. Uh, so we'll jump into some questions here. It uh, looks like we do have a, a question here uh, from Richard, of all people, uh, asking, <laughs> how do you evaluate a potential investment? So what do you look for in screens, quality criteria, balance of financial strength, whether it be debt to uh, profitability, things like that? Uh, that's a great question because it brings in so many um, strands of how we might uh, look at value. But to answer it in the most literal way first, I'm really spending every morning looking at as many uh, sets of results as I can across the UK and Europe, reading all the results that come out, which are sometimes, uh, you know, 100 as many as 100, you know, reading a lot of material to update myself as, on businesses that I know something about and looking for new businesses. What am I looking for? Uh, definitely quality. Quality is the most important characteristic of a business, most important characteristic, therefore, of, a, of an underlying stock. Uh, there are negative things. You mentioned uh, Richard, great name. Um, you mentioned uh, debt to equity, so too much debt is a no-no. Um, net cash is a big positive, but how does quality man manifest itself? Uh, it's uh, the industry, uh, the set of results, how frank the management is, and uh, a whole series of intangibles, I suppose, as well. And from then, uh, normally I would place something on a, on a screen of our own, which is, say, um, some kind of portfolio device and monitor it, keep on reading about it, thinking about it, and eventually something will trip. Maybe the price will go down. Maybe there'll be a big exogenous event like this pandemic, and that will give us an opportunity to, to buy. Absolutely. And on that note, I guess uh, one of the, the past questions I've seen that I've, I found interesting coming from our, our audience that we can go ahead and add on to this one is when you are looking at those documents, do you kind of hone in on one specific thing right off the get-go? Is there a, a specific number that you look for right off the bat? Um, I would have said, if you'd asked me that question five or ten years ago, return on capital, because it was something that Buffett, you know, who was my my teacher, uh, talked about so much in his uh, in his writings. In a in a way, I do now. That's more of a minimum hurdle. And so, a business with a low return on capital, uh, just as a business with a high amount of debt, uh, is probably not going to survive because it won't have the neither of them will have a capacity to generate much cash. 
and cash in the end is what's going to to give us value one way or the other cash being produced so return on capital as a minimum debt to equity or ebit to operating profit to interest coverage as a minimum as a as a maximum um, would be the numbers that i look for obviously uh, growth in uh, demand uh th- those are those would be the numerical answers yeah. absolutely and a, a question here from from wk uh, which i think uh, is one that comes up a lot for for those of us here in the states where do you search and get uk business um i know they don't necessarily do quarterly reports but those kind of semi-annual reports that are generally coming out there Okay, so I already mentioned that I'm looking at uh, all the results. So what I do is go to a, a website called Investigate with an E, um, and they publish on a, on a link from the London Stock Exchange, I guess, the RNS system it's called, every single uh, set of results and trading statements in the UK um, on, a, on a daily basis. So I look on there, there's probably 200 by 8 o'clock in the morning, um, I open up as many as I as I want to. I get names that are familiar, names that are unfamiliar. Forget the names that are not going to be that interesting to me, which is usually oil and gas companies, companies that are very exotic locations, uh, investment trusts generally, not the liquidating ones, but most of them are probably not going to be that interesting. And read my way through. And pretty soon, these are these. He's quite right, uh, Mr. WK or Miss Ms. WK. But these are on a six monthly basis. But in the UK, companies generally issue trading statements a couple of times a year as well. So you're probably seeing about four times, four sets of results anywhere in the UK or guidance. And I read as much as I can. And pretty soon, soon being measured in years, I mean, rather than months, you build up a just as you would do in the States, you build up a, a, a sort of encyclopedia, Wikipedia in your head of the sorts of businesses that you like. And I should say the sorts of industries that you like. I mentioned some industries I don't like, but there are industries I like, like uh, asset management uh, is, a, is a very good uh, business if it's not um, being beaten up by uh, by index funds. You can find something that's... Uh, genuinely growing. We have an asset manager in our top four holdings as well, Premier Mighton. And um, so I pay particular attention to to indus- interesting industries, industries interesting to me, that is. Absolutely. And uh, another com- or a question I should say here coming in, um, asking, and you just uh, hit on this a little bit, but would you recommend ETFs rather than single stocks for those investing more on kind of a, a private basis, or could a diversified portfolio of say twenty stocks offer enough security for them? In your opinion? Uh, well, that's sort of tr- treading slightly outside my area. It, you know, only that, that it sounds like more like general financial advice. And I guess the easy answer is it depends on who you are. If you're someone like me who's sort of on the border of obsessive maybe over the border at this stage uh then you're going to be interested in single stocks for sure because a that's where the <laughs> this sound a bit odd to say but that's where the truth is you know that's where the real uh, cash flow is being produced the an etf is just a you know a, a collection of individual stocks um and secondly because if your job is to outperform which is part of what the other part of my job is to preserve capital but Part of my job is to outperform the market. It's just mathematically impossible to do that if you're not concentrated. However, if you're, as it sounds like this person is, um, an individual who's not prepared to be obsessive, then an ETF or an index fund is a perfectly intelligent way of investing in the market. And indeed, uh, that's my that's what I and my family do. They they uh, in, invest in index funds. It's just a, a simpler, um, no-brainer way of, of uh, investing, remaining invested. ETFs, uh, which can be you know, sec- sector-specific, that's probably a bit in between for my taste. So I personally would either go for single stocks or for a, a whole market. Understood. And looking over in the past, uh, in past responses here today, 
Uh, you've hit a little bit on this question of kind of hitting on metrics that you like, but you also did bring up management. How much would you say you weight either one of those as far as investment goes? Does management outweigh metrics, or would you rather the, the business be healthy and, say, have poor management if, if we can go to that extent, I guess? Uh, that's another difficult one in that there's not there's not one correct answer. Obviously, the obvious answer is you want both, right? If you're only going to pick, say, 10 stocks, uh, there's a thousand stocks or in your country, maybe 10,000 stocks that you're not investing in. So why not go for the, you know, the big, uh, not the Big Mac, the big piñata? I don't know what the big thing is at the moment, but, you know, go for the whole enchilada, right? Go for the whole enchilada and... Uh, and get great management and a great business. Um, but I'll just add, add this, that I, I, I do see when I look back at our, our very biggest returns, outside liquidations, which, which are uh, you know, very much a strategy on their own, but certainly in our, in our, in our growth companies, which are the biggest part of our funds, um, the thing that probably distinguishes them more than any uh, the winners, the big winners, more than anything else, is the quality uh, the integrity, of course, but most of all, and I don't hear a lot of people talking in these terms, the energy and the enthusiasm of the management. Um, so if you find an energetic CEO or management team who are really determined to win, win with the, with the customers generally, and to a secondary extent, win against the competition, then that's a very good sign. And that's not to ignore the metrics, but if the metrics st stack up, and you've got a very energetic, very enthusiastic, motivated um, manager or managers, that will, that will be the best sign. Absolutely. Now, it looks like we had a, another couple of questions roll in here. Um, looking like uh, the Richards are out in force today, uh, joining you. Uh, one, first off, uh, asking up top are you concerned looking at naked wines uh it looks like the business is not profitable in their opinion has management given any indication of when they're expecting that profitability to kind of turn around and then further continuing on from that from our, our previous richard asking looking at earnings per share return on invested capital um, seems like those are kind of struggling over the last couple of years some comments there Oh, these Richards are really uh, tough and, and bright, bright people. What, what a coincidence! Uh, it's not me, by the way, sending in these questions. So, um, to go back, to go slightly deeper into naked wines, it's a very good question. If you look at the uh, the superficialities, uh, you know, the surface numbers, naked wines is not profitable or barely profitable. That is actually um, an intention of the company, and you'll you'll remember this, Graham, because we went into it last time, but. Naked Wines um, essentially loses money on purpose through marketing promotions. So you will get in your Amazon delivery box a voucher from Naked Wines that says you can have $50 off or $70 off your first order of wine. You're not, it looks like you, you've actually received one. Got of these. one the other day. And <laughs> well, do cash it in because it's a genuine offer, you know, which will save you money. You will get a case of wine very, very cheap. And then a certain percent, and that's a loss, that's a loss leader. And then a certain percentage of people who trial that, who try that, there's no commitment from it at all, by the way. It's not like the old book of the month club where you ordered three and they kept on sending you books forever. Um, so that's a, a non-commitment deal. But a certain percentage through human nature will think, well, this is a good idea. It's better than going to the, the shops. Here I am stuck at, stuck at home. I'll order some more. And so a certain percentage convert into subscribers. And as probably most of your viewers know, uh, including I hope the Richards, the subscri subscriber businesses have uh, manifest uh, advantages as businesses and to investors. I already mentioned the negative working capital. So cash comes up front, which Naked Wines is using to reinvest in more marketing and promotions. And that continuing business, which includes the angels business that I mentioned, but that's not the whole of the business, but that continuing business is highly profitable. 
And so the question becomes, uh, well, several questions. Do you believe they're accounting? Are they moving losses or profits from one bit to the other? Uh, we, we do. Um, secondly, could they be profitable? And the answer is yes. Uh, they, they publish, you can go and look at their, uh, their six monthly announcements are right at the bottom, right at the very bottom of each announcement. They do their estimate of what the ongoing business's profitability is if all they did was use marketing promotions to replace, to replenish the, the churn, the people who stop being subscribers. And on that basis, the business is highly profitable. You can value it in different ways, but that's a, that's a very convenient way of, of uh, proving to yourself if you, if you want to. Um, that the underlying business, the business that would continue if they, they weren't losing money on this massive amount of marketing promotions, um, is profitable. As to the question of will they be profitable, the clever answer, and probably the right answer, is we hope that they won't be profitable in that what we want, and I think what they want, is to keep on investing at the fastest possible, the highest possible rate they can, that's um consistent with the cash balance and consistent with not overspending. So they still want their four and a half or five times total customer lifetime value compared to um, what they're losing. And if they keep on doing that and the profitability only turns up in 10 years time, that's absolutely fine by us. The value of that business in 10 years will be substantially higher than the business today. And if they choose to turn off the marketing promotions at that time, or if, like Amazon, the business just naturally scales more into a profit. Um, you can see a very similar business, Trupanion, which you probably know, um, which is an American vet business, very similar sort of um, dynamics. Um, if, they, if they do scale into profitability, then that's all to the good. But if they don't and they choose to carry on spending, then we're not, we're not complaining. Absolutely. And looks like a, another question rolling in here on a more generalized basis. When you are looking at an investment, how important is return on invested capital being greater than weighted average cost of capital on a company's balance sheet? Okay, so I kind of answered that one already uh, in, in that uh, when I was talking return on capital, I said that five years, maybe 10 years ago, that would have been the most important metric in a way, and that was because of the heavy influence of Buffett on me. And that was that was one of the only measures that he put in his shopping list for, if you remember, for companies he wanted to acquire. He wanted low debt, a, a business that could run itself, I think. And the third one was a high return on invested capital. Well, well this must be important. And I wrote a book you know, many years ago in the, the late 90s that was all about this. But for a number of reasons, that's become less important, except as a minimal test. So it's terribly important that a business either is returning or in the case of a business like Naked Wines will return more than it's invested capital. Naked Wines actually has negative capital. And that's a clue. A lot of businesses now have negative capital, uh, that is negative tangible capital or very, very low capital. Businesses like Amazon, Facebook, um, Alphabet, um, Apple, Microsoft and so on. These are businesses with extremely high returns on tangible capital. That's capital uh, subtracting cash, net cash, and um, purchased goodwill and tangibles, but uh, um, acquired intangibles. Um, but they're so far above what you might regard as a good number. A good number, I suppose, traditionally was regarded as 20%. That was a good business. But some of these businesses are either like 80% or they're, as I say, infinite. So it ceases to be as meaningful as it was except as a minimal test, then you're on your own. You really, you've got to face up to the future. That's the most important aspect of investing is to understand the future of a business within limits. You know, with Electra, I gave an example of where I thought the minimum was and the maximum was. So all these businesses that uh, you're considering, you should really have some idea, say uh, in 10 years time, what the business might look like and the return on invested capital should continue to be good, but that's just the starting point really for, for where you might end up in terms of valuation. Absolutely. 
And as far as looking out into the the future and I guess kind of predicting, are you are you modeling uh, say cash flows for these companies, or do you tend to avoid kind of doing those types of calculations? Yeah, I don't I don't very often do a do a formal model uh, uh, like with uh, Naked Wise again, probably a good example. If if I if I believe that on an underlying continuing operations business, I've paid without the cash, I don't know, say 12 times taxed earnings for that business. And if I think that business can grow 10 or 20 times in the next 10 or 15 years, say, you could do a model, but what's it going to say? It's going to say you're going to make a massive amount of money, Richards, and Derby Street's going to be very, very happy. Does it matter if the, you know, if the IRR is 25% or 55%. It might if you've got other, you know, really first class opportunities of that sort to measure it against. But the reality is the model is not going to tell you, not going to give you the answer. The answer is really in the two or three sentences that I summarized the business in, which are are mainly qualitative. You know, is this a good industry? Is this a good player in the industry? Is there going to be growth? And then a few quantitative tests of the sort that I mentioned. Is there going to be excessive debt? Is there eventually going to be a high return on capital? How is the cash flow going to develop? And you, sh- you, you ought to be able to, if you're, if you're a mature investor anyway, you ought to be able to summarize that for yourself without um, relying on a model, I think. Absolutely. And continuing on to another question we do have coming in here. Um, on a similar note, would you say that uh, a return on tangible assets is important at all in an investment today? Okay, so question is, you're not hearing my answers yet. Obviously, there's a <laughs> lag between my answers. That's the, that's the third way of answering the same question. So I'll just add in one little bit of uh, uh, extra industry knowledge, if you like, is what, what we mean by tangible assets. So as I already said, return on capital is an important minimum test. Generally speaking, what I would do is is subtract the cash, um, add back the debt, and there is a sort of little glitch when you come to deciding what is uh, an intangible asset. So there are really, in general, two types of intangible assets. There's acquired goodwill, where a business buys another business, and in some cases, in some countries, needs to put the goodwill up, the difference between the acquired business's tangible assets and the purchase price. And that we would take off. But there are other, these days particularly, a whole lot of other intangible assets which are disguised or sometimes disguised um, expenses, real expenses. And uh, that typically that would be um, development of software. Or if you look at Netflix, just announced their results, that's purchase of content. And they don't disguise it, they amortize it. But you really got to look through to the underlying cash flows there. And in terms of the, the, the measure of return on tangible uh, assets, I call it return on capital, because you really want to include um, the, per- the routinely purchased intangible assets in that calculation on both sides. Um, there's one other little glitch, but it's so deep that I won't uh, bore you all with it, but it's to do with lease accounting. And uh, that's something else you've got to consider carefully as to whether you're going to capitalize leases in that, in that measurement. Absolutely. So now that we have uh, poked, I guess, as much as we possibly can on <laughs> turn and invest to capital assets, things like that. Yeah, don't ask me. Don't ask me that one again. We we we've, we've we've got it at this point. Uh, <laughs> continuing on, uh, one of our I guess favorite questions, and you briefly uh, hinted at it earlier, uh, would be when when do you actually reach a point when you are going to sell off a holding, maybe not in its entirety, but say a significant portion of it? Is there a specific point in time or value that you have to hit, or is it more of a, a complex decision there? It is complex, and it's it's changed somewhat in an interesting way in the last year, and I'll come to the reason why for that in a in a moment. But the the, the core um, two reasons in general why you would sell something are first because something's gone wrong, 
So the, 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 the thesis that you had in your mind that I said earlier, you know, you've got 10 years of growth, just goes wrong. And there's a new competitor, the management turn out to be not as good. Sometimes they make an extremely expensive acquisition, as they did in a business uh, called Clarkson, which is a big ship broker that we held very successful for many years. They went and bought a uh, essentially an investment bank for a lot of money, which didn't make a lot of sense, so we sold it. Um, so things going wrong, that's a good reason to sell. And secondly, things reaching your valuation target. That is a bit of a poison chalice, to be honest. If you've got an excellent business, um, you should be very careful about selling. That's my experience. Um, it'll probably carry on being excellent. I know there's people who believe in the opposite, the reversion to the mean. Uh, that's not been my experience. And so what, you know, you might have put a, a notional target based on 30 times earnings because you paid 15 times earnings. So that business, if you have a think about it, it might be worth 60 or 100 times earnings quite, you know, easily if it's an excellent business growing at, you know, 25%, whatever, uh, on an annualized basis. So I'd be very careful about that. The thing that's changed in the last year is related to something that I said earlier, which is that we, we had a lot of cash, we spent a lot of cash, and essentially, we ran out of cash in the fund uh, in that we, we became pretty fully invested. And then there were things that I still wanted to buy. I suppose I could have called up my shareholders and said, you know, come up with some more cash, but I, I'm too meek to do that. So I did end up um, selling some things. And it's probably not very difficult to guess why. The things that I sold, in my opinion, had more, they had upside, but they had more limited upside than the things that I wanted to buy. So Naked Wines has this, what I hope will be very, very high upside. I wanted to buy more of that. But in the pandemic, uh, first wave of uh, opportunities, for example, we bought four property companies, excuse me. And um, these were pretty much, in three cases anyway, asset plays in the, we were buying at a very steep discount to what we thought the net asset value would end up at once all the write downs had worked through uh, from the valuers. And two of those were extremely conventional institutional property companies, REITs, in fact, land securities and British land. And then um, one of them went up a lot, one, one of them went up a little bit. Um, but I thought, you know, for the sake of Yes, I don't know what the upside, maybe 50% upside at that point. Um, I would rather have 1,000% upside. So that was a portfolio management or opportunity cost decision. But that was an unusual, that was an unusual situation to be in, I must say. Definitely. And I guess I'll continue to, to poke at the cash question here just out of curiosity. Are you, or would you, I guess, since you, hinted at being relatively fully invested at this point in time but if you had the ability to would you try to be holding extra cash right now for say a potential crash that a lot of our previous guests have hinted at coming in the future uh, well i wish them luck and i'm pleased that they've got a view into the future that um i'm not saying i don't share it i just don't have a way of sensing that no, um, I'm happy to be completely fully invested and my own history, which is you know, reasonably long now, so it's certainly over 20 years of investing, including at least three quite big crashes, um, is that, you know, that's a much more intelligent way of going. You can't predict these things. You can't say I'll sell now in the hope that things will be lower in six months time. That, I think that's a mugs game, as we call it here. Um, no, it's purely bottom-up driven. If there are things that are exciting, things that are thrilling, because to me the, the upside is very manifest and the downside is limited, then I'll want to own them. I won't be positioning myself for some notional crash that may never happen. I say never happen. Maybe it'll be in 10 years' time, and then I've missed you know, an enormous amount of upside. So we buy businesses... We buy good businesses. We buy good businesses which are cheap by our estimates. And if there are good businesses that are cheap, then I'll want to I'll want to own them. Understood. 
And another question coming in from uh, WK here again. Uh, you mentioned earlier the that website you like to rely on for those UK reports. Um, he's asking, is there a, a Barron's equivalent um, looking at UK businesses over there or any other, I guess, publications on that note that you'd recommend specifically geared towards UK businesses? Uh, there are publications, which by and large I don't read. The Financial Times is the most uh, famous. There's a retail magazine called Investors Chronicle. Of course, there are lots of blogs and um Yours, yours is one of them, Graham, which I, you know, highly recommend. Lots of ways to get ideas, but I, I honestly think that going straight to the businesses and getting a sense of industry, individual industries, individual players. If you like the investment management business, you know, you can read. I don't know how much. Say, there's 20 quoted investment managers in the UK. Probably not even that many. So you can read the whole lot. When I was first buying in the property industry 20 years ago more than 20 years ago, I read the whole lot. It doesn't take a lot of time. And you'll soon get an idea of the industry, how valuations might develop, and also who are the strong um, and well-run businesses, where the players in, in those industries. And that's what I'd really recommend. If you're relying on tips, which I'm not suggesting that WK ever would, you're not developing your own strengths. Um, so I'm not a big fan, other than in your case, Graham, of of uh, of publications, uh, and I don't uh, recommend uh, research either. I think that's very short term focus usually. Absolutely. Well, a couple of options for you there, WK, to go ahead and take a peek if you feel so inclined. And obviously, we encourage you to keep reading everything from Guru Focus here. <laughs> Uh, looks like, as far as audience questions go, uh, we have another one uh, poking at some ratios. I don't know that we necessarily need to dive into it. I think we've we've hit on our metrics enough here today. Uh, we do have some appreciation uh, from John, one of our usual uh, viewers, uh, for bringing enthusiasm into the equation, uh, saying thank you for sharing your wisdom uh, on that today. Um, and some additional thank yous rolling in now here as well. So I think at that point in time, that will round out those questions from our audience. Uh, Richard, it's been an absolute pleasure as per usual. Thank you so much for joining us today. We love having you on, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, visit once again in the future, maybe another six months down the road, call it. That's great. Thank you so much, Graham. Nice to see you again, and take care. Absolutely. Yourself as well. And for those of you out in the audience, we wish you well. Uh, please do go like the video, subscribe to the channel, do all the usual YouTube goodies over there. And we'll see you next week for our next guest. It's been an absolute pleasure.